Now, <clears throat> I'm going to try and categorize you um, just briefly at the outset. So um, it'll help with a little feedback question that I'm going to do uh, about three quarters of the way through the talk. So I'm going to define what I mean by a supreme eco-warrior. And I want you to decide whether you come into that description. So a supreme eco-warrior, by my definition, is someone who is seriously scared about the climate crisis. They've got no faith that technology is going to save us from it any day soon. And they've got little faith in the path that our government is um, on at the moment. Now, does anybody feel they come into that category at the moment? <laughs> right, it's quite a high percentage, less than half. Now, you folks who didn't put your hands up, you're my target audience here. And I know, I know that a lot of people here are affiliated with Extinction Rebellion, so I'm not surprised at um, the fact that there are quite a few who are supreme eco-warriors. Um, but I am aware that in the general population, it's the percentage of such attitudes is very low indeed. It's probably less than 3%, I would guess. So we'll just have a little look at where the UK is in terms of dealing with the crisis. They've declared their emergency. They were the first country to do that. They've set their target, net zero, by 2050. And in that respect, they've enshrined it in law. And in that respect, they're the leaders in the fight against climate crisis. Now, uh, we have an independent committee called uh, for climate change. And their job is to assess how we're getting on to achieve that target. And they are currently telling us from last year, their assessment was, we're not on target. Now, the climate crisis is a cumulative problem. And we're on year one of a 30-year project, and we're already adrift. Now, all that CO2 that we're adrift by, that's going to hang around all those 30 years and exacerbate the problem. So it's more challenging than, than it was when we first set the target. This is not a good example to set the world. The whole world needs to reach that target if we're going to avoid catastrophic climate breakdown. The whole world needs to meet 2050. So the logical conclusion is, if we're the leaders, we're not making our target, we're setting a bad example, we can assume that, we can assume that the whole world will fail to meet that target, which means that we are definitely heading for catastrophic <coughs> climate breakdown if we continue the way that we're going at the moment. So we'll have a little look at, um, oh, we're going to have a, we, the situation we're in, because we're off track, because, um, the rest of the world are lagging behind us anyway. It's an extremely high risk situation. And the stakes couldn't be higher because it's the health of our planet that is at stake in the climate crisis. So in a, any risk manager would tell you, in a high risk, high stakes situation, you need to do everything you can. Now, when when the, when the government first, first declared the emergency, I, I fully expected that they would run an awareness campaign of the type that they did with smoking, seat belts, explaining to people the level of risk that we're exposing ourselves to by, by our behavior. Now that didn't happen and it still hasn't happened. I thought they'd have a nice slogan like fossil fueled flying can injure your future and that of your children. Something simple and honest like that. But obviously that was extremely naive of me because that would damage our tourist economy. And of course, money in our culture 
is far more important than our environment. So that was very silly of me to expect anything like that. So that, as yet, we are not ready for that level of honesty. What about the media? How do they report on the climate crisis? For example, last year we had record temperatures in summer. And um, as far as I could see, they didn't actually link that with the fact that we're in a climate crisis. It looked like they were actually celebrating it as if it was a, an achievement. And they accompanied it with bathing beauties in their bikinis. It's not helpful, not helpful to give that sort of image when you're in a very high risk, very high stakes situation. So whose problem? Whose problem is this? Is it, is it the politicians who should be sorting it out? Is it the businessmen? No, I would say, I would say it is our problem. We're all collectively responsible for where we are now. The environmentalists and the scientists have been telling us for decades that um, we are trapped in this greenhouse and we're making the glass thicker every day by our activities. And we have no way of making the glass thinner. So it's a cumulative problem that we've been buying into for decades. And we've thoroughly enjoyed it. There are so many lovely things that we enjoy as a result of our current culture. We're in, in a utopia. We're protected from our natural world. We live in our little boxes, which are nice and warm when it's cold outside. So it's a man-made problem. We've all contributed to it, to it. And we all need to acknowledge our guilt and the fact that we have a role to play in solving it. So what's our attitude to the fire alarm? The fire alarm are the climate protesters going around hysterically, digging up lawns apparently. <coughs> well, you know, we, we have freedom of speech. We, um, we tolerate them. Like any minority group, we put up with them. Um, but not oh, when they stop us going around uh, about our business as usual, we, we find them extremely annoying. And um, certainly back at this um, headline is from the Whitney Gazette. They, October last year, the climate protester spent two weeks in London trying to have an impact on public opinion and primar primarily targeting government buildings. But you won't have seen, they had some lovely colorful displays going on, but that, that won't have come through the media. <coughs> no, the, the one thing that the media, media latched on to was one, one action in Canning Tube <coughs> Station, which I'm sure the media realized, oh, this will alienate the public and, and the media, like the rest of us, they don't, they don't want to give up all their luxuries. They don't want to give up their foreign holidays like the rest of us. Everything else that goes with the culture that we're in at the moment, we love it all. So that heading was probably true. It's not actually substantiated in the text because the text is a article by our MP in West Oxfordshire, Robert Quartz, explaining how well the UK are doing in the climate crisis. Um, so, but I, I suspect that um, the Whitney Gazette chose that title. And like I say, I'm sure, the, I have no quest, doubt the verac of the veracity of it, but I do question the motivation in choosing that title. I, I get the feeling they were hoping to push, steer, steer the public to, to lose support for the um, activists. And very effective, very effective it was as well. Now, also in that article, um, 
Robert Quartz talks about um, a concept called eco-socialism dismissively saying, these climate protesters, they're talking about us making huge sacrifices in order to tackle this crisis. They're talking about us giving up our foreign holidays, unthinkable things. They're talking about revolutionizing our economy so that instead of measuring things by money, we measure it by biodiversity. And uh, it doesn't actually say in detail what, what eco-socialism would be, but that is essentially the idea is that we should be measuring our prosperity by soil health, biodiversity, a sustainable size population. Now, if we look at our GDP, we're a very, very rich country, very prosperous. If we look at our biodiversity, our soil health, and whether we can support our own population, sustain it within our borders, we're in a lot of trouble and we're very vulnerable. And if the climate crisis causes one of our bread baskets to fail, we would have a hell of a job to sustain the population that lives within our borders. But it's all the way, this is our culture, this is, where, this is the way we measure how well off we are, by money. So we're trapped in a box that has existed for decades, which is business as usual. It's a consumer culture that we all love and we, none of us want to let go. Now, also in the article, there, he also mentions that the UK Committee on Climate Change, who are the ones that are telling us that we're not reaching our target, are also telling us that it's not credible that we could achieve, oh, sorry. It's not cred credible that we can achieve net zero, zero any earlier than 2050. Now, of course, the UK Committee on Climate Change are not, are not paid to be visionary thinkers. So certainly I would agree with them it's not credible, if, so long as we're sticking to our business as usual mode of modus operandum. However, if we were to make that step and start thinking outside the box and thinking perhaps we could make sacrifices to tackle this crisis, then I, I think as um, Nelson Mandela observed in terms of very challenging, <sighs> In t in, when you're facing a really big challenge, he says it, it always seems impossible until it's done. And I think that could apply in this case, but we would have to change our way of thinking about it. Now, the, the culture that we love so much that we're in at the moment, that actually has not existed all that long because humankind before the agriculture and the industrial revolutions humankind their their main challenges in life were battling with the elements surviving surviving the natural world now with the agriculture and the industrial revolution that changed and the challenge became earning money and, and deciding how to spend it and that actually meant that the physical problem that is driving climate crisis, which is burning fossil fuels, actually coincide, coincided with the change in culture that is causing us to be unable to be realistic about the risks that we're facing. And those two revolutions, the situation was further aggravated when it was followed by the technological revolution, which enabled us even more spend time so that we could escape into all sorts of virtual reality 
which disconnected us even more from the natural world and made us even less aware of how much damage we were doing to it. And um, Oh, we got, we, the things that we get anxious and worried about in our lives now, they, they're often, you know, have we got the right branding? Have we, <laughs> you know, nobody wears that anymore. Fashion is, it's all, none of it's, none of it's essential to our health and welfare, but we spend millions on it. We've got whole industries that are non-essential. So although it, it has, has had some amazingly good outcomes, it has also had a very big downside that has made us insensitive to what's going on in our environment. We don't, we don't see the damage we've done because we're so protected from it. We're in, we live in such a protected environment. Poor old wildlife, we've already contained it so much. And now with all the flooding that we've got, they've got even less room to move around. But we're inclined just to think, oh, well, I'm not being flooded, so I'm all right. So we're insensitive, we're unrealistic about the situation that we're in with the climate crisis. And we think, we think we're invincible. We think technology can solve everything. But um, the climate crisis consists of climate tipping po points, which like dominoes are already starting to wobble. And we're in great danger of bequeathing to our next generation a great big bank balance and a barren earth. At the moment, our inability to grasp the magnitude of the danger that we're facing is actually more dangerous than the, de the, the physical phenomenon itself because we're unable to take all those actions that would mitigate the situation because we don't want to make the sacrifices. So we need to respect the fire alarm. The climate protesters are not extremist. It's the dangers that we're facing that are extreme. The difference between the climate protesters and the rest of the population is that they're being realistic about the risks and feeling the fear that comes with being in great danger. Whereas the rest of the population are hoping that technology is going to sort it all out, believing, believing that technology will sort it all out. So our reliance on technology and our overdeveloped imagination is currently preventing us from engaging fully in re with reality and feeling the worry and the anxiety and the fear and the panic that would motivate us to do something, <coughs> to do something really radical to address the problem. That, that would involve moving out of our comfort zone, giving up big sacrifices, noble sacrifices. And um, at the moment, we're suffering from a, an addiction, which I'm going to call affluenza. It's, um, it's fed by adm adverse advertisements, which are designed to create discontent and desire. Affluenza infects our thinking and is fueled by glossy magazines and advertisements. 
to break out of that trap, we need to start using our awareness on a whole different level. Firstly, we need to use our five senses of touch and smell and sight to see the damage that we're doing to the environment and to realize that it's not a problem that's a long way in the future that we've been thinking for so many years. It's here and now. We've had record temperatures in January. We've got flooding that the nature of which we've, it's so unusual. We have to be realistic. The problem is now. And as regard to the media, we need to th see through the emissions, see through that emphasis where they're pushing us to reassure us and lull us into a false sense of security. We need to resist the advertising. And we need to be realistic about the risks that we're facing. And the other main antidote is the way we assess everything that we do. We, ne we need to think selflessly. Instead of asking ourselves, can I afford it financially? We need to ask ourselves, can the planet afford it? Can the environment afford it? And be willing to spend more if it meant it would alleviate the problem. So earlier on, I, um, I defined a, a supreme eco-warrior as uh, someone who's extremely worried about how we're going on, thinking the technical fix is going to be too late, is already making big sacrifices, and um, aware there's no time to, to lose. I'm wondering, is uh, the eco-pacifist, on the other hand, they're, they're fairly comfortable in business as usual. They're, they really don't want to let go of those luxuries that they enjoy. They're, they're pretty optimistic the technical fix is going to come and dig us out of this. They're willing to make small sacrifices, but they're not going to give up their foreign holiday yet. Might not give up the golf yet. Um, can I have a little show of hands here, whether anyone who walked in the door as an eco-pacifist is thinking maybe, because it's a spectrum, are they thinking maybe they ought to be a little bit more eco-warrior? Has anybody moved at all along the scale. <laughs> well, I'm thinking I'm, I'm more of a pacifist from what I do, than rather than I'd like to think I'm an eco perhaps I'm not. Perhaps I'm somewhere in the middle. So, oh, you're disappointed. Yes, I'm <coughs> oh, yeah, so, you're well, then. Well, maybe, yeah. yeah, that's interesting. I think there should be something slightly in between. There is. It's a whole scale. I, what, I, what I'm asking, what I'm asking is, 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 have you shifted a little bit from the one from 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 that side to that side? Can, can you, can you yeah. spell out the sacrifices we have to make? We'll get we'll get on. That is the decision. As yeah. Which side of that? We'll, I'll talk about sacrifices <laughs> later on. Good question, huh? Okie dokie. So, we'll, um, okay. It is a lot about fear level. And um, the, I love this quote from, from Mark, Mark Twain, where he, he says that courage is resistance to fear. It's mastery of fear, not absence of fear. Now, I think that is what is ailing many of us. We're not frightened enough to do the sort of things like never flying ever again, or in my case, giving up my golf. It was a very painful realization that one of the recreations that I loved 
most was not compatible with being an eco-warrior. It involved me in my petrol car going miles to the golf club and then of course for the away matches going even more miles. So it was a, for me it was a huge step. And also I, had, I was in a big bungalow all on my own, took in a lodger. Couldn't justify just me on my own in the... Uh, so it's these sort of big sacrifices I'm talking about. Right. So, in this battle, in my opinion, I think public opinion is going to be either our strongest we we weapon or our downfall. Because <coughs> we're all empowered to, to change our opinion. Nobody... We can't, we can't ask politicians to solve this because they can't bully people to change, change their attitude, change their behavior. They could run an awareness campaign. That might help. Um, but if, if you were to shift from being an eco-pacifist into being an eco-warrior, what you will discover is that you're then moving into a minority group. And being in a minority group, you will need to be prepared to meet with derision and ridicule and condescension. My inspiration came from um, Greta, who at 15 was the lone figure outside the Swedish parliament with a little sign saying school strike for climate. Now I, 18 at school, I was aware of, we were taught about global warming, warming being uh, in the future. And I, I, I was a, I did maths and physics at university. So I understood the reality. And um, I also learned about Malthus theory of population and the both of them struck a chord with me and I decided then I would never have children. But I never expected then that I would live to see the day that global warming caught up with us. That did surprise me. Now, look at Greta, a lone person back in 2018 and there in the Americas, she had hundreds of thousands coming out to listen to her. So if this talk struck a chord with you at all this evening, then um, I would recommend to, to see through what the news don't talk to us about. I can re uh, recommend a, a Facebook page called Media Tell the Truth, which um, cover things like emissions and unfortunate uh, unhelpful emphasis that the media are inclined to indulge in. Then there's, um, there's also a, a website called carbonbrief.org and they, if you sign up to them, it's a free service. They will send you a, a summary daily that will uh, all, the, all the reputable newspaper, any articles to do with the climate in reputable newspapers, they summarise and uh, send, send this email. And if you want to see the detail, I give you the link to the main article. So if you... Uh, if you do actually raise your fear levels. If you manage that step and you manage to be critical of business as usual, then talking with friends, relatives and co colleagues will impact on public opinion because that can ripple out. It could even become a tidal wave if there were enough of us. Uh, And if you decide to reduce your own 
carbon footprint seriously, like the sort of decisions that I talked about, like giving up something that you really love because you know it's got a high carbon footprint, then you may have to do, you will be constrained to buy business as usual for, in certain respects because you will still be obliged to earn money to look after your family. So it's not easy to change your job. But um, you, certainly as far as ledger activities, you have a choice. You, no, nobody's forcing you to go on your foreign holidays. There you, you can vote with your feet. Any, any leisure activities, you can vote with your feet. You can sign petitions, write to MPs, support campaigns. And if you're really stressed by it, then I would recommend becoming a climate activist because there you will have the support of people who understand how you feel. And you won't feel, um, won't feel that you're, you're a bit crazy because nobody else feels as strongly as you do. So I repeat, this is, this is a collective responsibility unless we all change, all decide we're going to change and play our role. Um, we are probably doomed to fail. We're probably doomed to see what catastrophic climate breakdown can do. But it will be, we'll only have ourselves to blame really. We could influence the economy hugely with, with public opinion. If we, if, if we all decided we weren't going to have any foreign holidays, that side of our economy would collapse. It wouldn't have to be a decision made, a difficult decision made by our government. It would just happen. We could force, we could force all sorts of changes in the economy just by the way, but just with our purchasing power, absence of it, the whole of the fashion industry. And we're just buying into it at the moment. We're just going along with it all. I mean, we could, what about Christmas? You could just agree with all your family, you weren't gonna give any Christmas presents. I mean, I love Christmas. I'm not a bar humbug person, but it would make it so much easier without the presents side of it. But no, I might be, I might be a bit struggling to, with my Christmas lights. I do like my Christmas lights on my tree, but, but then, I am not a supreme eco-warrior myself, but I do recognise that we're going to have to make huge sacrifices because that technical, te it's not, that, with regard to technology, we need it as part of the solution, but until we recognise that it is a big part of the problem as well, then we are debilitating ourselves because we're, not allowing ourselves to, to buy into that emotional toolkit that could dig us out of this problem. So climate awareness is essentially about leaving your comfort zone, feeling, feeling that fear, being realistic about the risks, being realistic about what's at stake challenging social and economic norms and questioning whether they still apply and whether they're wise. Do we really, is the, is the income from the tourist industry really more important than our planet? Do you imagine what sort of message that would send to the outside world if we shut Bista village? Seriously, that, that is Chinese income. If we turn that down, China would get the message we were being serious about the climate crisis in one fell swoop. But oh, we'd have to give up a lot of money if we did that. That's not economic. That's not economic sense, is it? It might be environmental sense. 
It's not, not economic sense. This is the way we think. This is how we've been programmed. We've all been brought up to that way of thinking. It's a huge step, a huge step for us to, I mean, I cannot believe how some of my friends, you know, you know, I pay, for, I pay for a haul so I can do something like this. I pay for this, I pay for that. I am fortunate that I'm well off, but they are so conditioned to so being so careful with their money. They cannot understand how important it is to me to get a message out there. But it doesn't, what am I going to do with that money? I might as well spend it in some way that might help the situation. So, our lovely, rather damaged world, very damaged biosphere, is currently hanging by a thread. A live thread, the thread of public opinion. Your opinion will ripple out and affect other people. You need to feel fear in, in order to feel motivation. So don't be scared of fear. Our modern life, apparently, our mental health, anxiety, depression is going up and up. It's because we're living in a virtual world. We're so detached from reality. If we had a serious problem, if we got our teeth stuck into a serious problem, we'd be much healthier, I reckon, much healthier. Because we worry about things that are so out of proportion to, to survival in the natural world. Well, thank you very much for coming and listening to all that. Well, that, you, you've been a lovely audience. And you can all go home now.